Right. Tell me who you are, what you do, and why do you do it? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, thanks for having me on your podcast. My name is Dimitri Moraitis, and I'm co-founder and co-spiritual director of Spiritual Arts Institute. We're a nonprofit here in uh, Southern California in the uh, Encinitas, San Diego area. And we, we teach people metaphysics, how to help grow and evolve their soul. I've been a teacher for many years now. I've been in metaphysics for the majority of my life. And uh, we write books. Uh, the person I co-founded with, she's one of the world's leading clairvoyants and aura specialists. And uh, we do ongoing classes. Uh, yes, online, in person. And it's been a labor of love. Let's put it that way. Everything we do is to help you help the soul grow. So for people who are listening, you don't know what metaphysics is. What is metaphysics? Well, metaphysics uh, the technically means after the physical. So the idea is that uh, the physical life isn't all there is to life. I know there's a big thing. We're just a bunch of atoms bouncing around and energy, and that's really all we are. And while, of course, our atoms bouncing around in physical energy and this physics that we know better than ever before, that's not the essence of who we are. The essence of our consciousness, the essence of our life is spiritual. And what you try to do is reconnect with that spiritual part of you to create a more fulfilling life. So when I was younger, I was into like ghosts and spirits and the afterlife. And I really got into psychics. And when I was having these psychic calls, I found that whatever I was projecting out, he was picking up exactly what I was thinking, right? As if I was on the phone to somebody right. and I was telling them what I wanted to hear and he was picking it up. And I've also right. had psychics where I put out a blockage. I didn't want them to pick anything up and it was just all over the place, <laughs> scrambled, it was a lot of crap basically. And I wanted to believe in the afterlife and the metaphysical world so bad that I've convinced myself that my grandma had passed away years ago was here and I was speaking to her literally as if she was here but obviously she wasn't here so I've always thought maybe I wanted to experience that and she was never here or maybe she was here end of the day we're never going to know but regardless having that experience with the metaphysical world it it transformed my life because it basically showed me that there is more out there right Full, right, full right. stop. Whether it was there or not, it told me at that point there's more to just my surroundings and the most amazing out of this world stuff used to happen as a result of her being there and only when she was there, if great, she was there. Great. Well, you you bring up a very good point um, because it's a you know this is an ancient study. If you if you and I were like back in the days of ancient Greece, we'd be joining a mystery school where we'd be studying this methodically because. You had what we would call, and you had it as a child, uh, a spiritual awakening. Maybe you couldn't say specifically this, that, and the other happened, but you knew something non-ordinary happened, and you weren't losing your mind. Um, because some people do have what we call counterfeit experiences. Let's say yeah, they want their grandmother to be there so bad that they kind of create their grandmother. you know. But other times, they are really seeing their grandmother. It's really happening. Uh, actually, it's funny you tell me that Bar uh, Barbara, my you know co the co-founder, um, she she's Greek. Well, I'm Greek too. <laughs> and one day she was getting ready to cross the street. Now this was her godmother who had died and she adored. She hears her godmother from the other side saying in Greek, "Step back." And Barbara just instinctively did that. And there was a car that she just completely did not see mm -hmm. careening around the corner. And bingo, that's it, you know. So what, is that coincidence? Is that you hearing a voice in your head? Is that for real? Well, even if it was a voice in my head, it was right. <laughs> and I'm gonna pay attention to it, you know. Yeah, um, there are lot, you know, there are lots of cases where, you know, there's a, a cardiologist that wanted to do research because a uh, cardiac surgeon, I'm sorry. He said, I, I can't tell you how many of my patients when they come out of the surgery, they are describing in detail what I did during the surgery, saying they were out of their body and watching the whole thing. And it's just too much to be a coincidence. You can't know it that. I mean, they're deep, deep, deep under, right? And to be aware of what was going on and even going on in rooms around the surgery room. So something is really going on. 
<laughs> See, I love that. So when I was 21, I was <clears throat> going through my awakening, whatever. I was speaking to my grandma, grandma in my head, right? And I was driving back from somewhere. My head was a mess. And I just put my foot down. And there was basically cars one side. And the other side was where only only room for one cars to go straight forward or my way. So I was in my head and I was just going down that at 60 miles an hour. And all of a sudden I became aware from being in my head that there was a car right in front and I was about to have a head on crash. And there's nowhere for oh. my car to go or for that car to go. And as you say, in that very moment, I slowly heard indicate to the left, go into second gear, go up on the curb perfectly where the, you know, where the curb is, there's like a little non-curb bit, right? My car left wheels went up there. There's a lamp post there and a post box. Missed that perfectly. There was like, say, <laughs> two inches gap between my right hand side car and that and that car. And I was so far on the curb that my wheel was literally touching the curb. And I went straight past the car, went down the curb on the other bit as it went down. OK, looked in my wind mirror, the, the you know, the back mirror. And I just saw the car there with the brake lights on. And the point is that I was guided in that moment of what to do in that situation when I should have had a head on oh. crash. Um, oh, wow. I just had that when when shit hit the fan, like with the person crossing the road, stay back. When shit hit the fan, I was taken over by something else, grandma, right. whatever you want to call right. it, and saved my life. <laughs> And, you must um, have yeah. really loved your grandmother. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But interestingly, after that, she said everything's going to be okay, and I never spoke to her again. Oh wow! Oh, that was the last one. That was the last one. Oh. Yeah. Oh, oh well, what a way to say goodbye. But you know, no love is lost. What we say is, when it's your time to cross over, you'll see her again. You know that, that that's uh, they do have a full life over there. And while they do come to help us, they need to also go on and do their own things over there. So you have to say, Grandma, don't worry, I'm doing great. Thank you for saving my life so I can be here a little longer. And I can't wait to see you again. <laughs> the thing is, right, yeah. if if she was there or not, or whether I wanted her to be there, regardless, I th there was stuff happening only at that time. Like when I'd go to bed, I'd imagine that she was hovering around my Mac. And every time I was in that state of she's around my Mac, my Mac would turn on. Right. So mm. and that would only happen when I'm believing she's there. And then when right. I didn't believe she was there, the Mac wouldn't turn on. And because I'm all about understanding every aspect, I'm like, OK, what other way is there to explain this? And I realized yeah. that, you know, static energy, you know, it, certain frequency creates a certain power that the Mac can turn on with like a little charge basically not completely on but enough charge to get the hard drive going so did i simply focus my attention and energy there for so long in a deep meditative state at night time that my own energy was charging up the mac and she wasn't there and i was believing that she was there so i was focusing there and that was charging the mac or was she actually there and there were so many other things like I put sticky labels on my door, num number them one to 28 post-it notes. And I'd leave the house and say, Grandma, knock off number 23. I'd come back, 23 is on the floor. And I could do it with any post-it note, 16, 4, <laughs> and it's on the floor. And it is like, it was too like someone's doing too coincidental. this. Too coincidental. But, but yeah. was she doing this? And if she was here, how can I get back into say contact with her because I convinced myself it was it was all me but at the same point I don't actually know how can I get her back in the way that she was here to do the same things to tell me there is an afterlife well I think she's already done that quite frankly and I think she, you know in other words it's not a you want to be careful we'd be fascinated by this you know there was a great the uh, well she had a there's a big center in in Great Britain, the Theosoph Theosophical you know, Society. And, and uh, Helena Blavatsky was one of the great mystics of her age. And she used to do psychic demonstrations. And her teachers from the other side would say, don't do that. Focus on the mysteries, you know, focus on the teaching. And the problem was she got, when she did that, they didn't want to hear about the mysteries. They wanted to see the, the phenomena. 
and it, it had a very big toll on her at the end of her life. She got very heavy. She got sick. So the point is, if these experiences, let's say in your case, awakened you, first of all, it was great that you didn't just automatically accept it at face value, that you're willing, as you said, to see all sides of the coin, because that keeps you, you know, we got many people in this work, they throw common sense out the window, right? They just think, oh, they could be logical at work, but here they're just believing the craziest things, right? So you're you're keeping it balanced, right? Um, but once you've got the inkling, there's got to be something more. Maybe if it was your grandmother, it was pointing you in the direction. It was saying, start to explore metaphysics. When when I had my awakening, I was in the arts. I was going to be a filmmaker, and uh, I was also a classical pianist. And at the time, I was having what was called I call just called these inspiration moments. They were very heightened, you know, heightened levels of awareness, and I was very grounded, very aware of what was going on, and kind of almost like kind of like you're saying, reading people's thoughts or understanding their intentions without meaning to. Um, and it led to my spiritual awakening, you know. But that was the beginning of the journey. From there, I've been on. I've been training. Barbara was my has been my teacher for many many years. And why I, I I realized she would be my teacher is she was putting all these experiences into a they made sense of them. It started, oh, okay, now I'm beginning to understand. So what we hope is when other people and maybe people on your listening to your podcast, if they've had this inner awakening, it's a call. It's a call of the divine to start to explore these things more carefully and to try to there's a science behind all of this. It's a very, very ancient science. And it's just as scientific as anything here, just as methodical. It's just you have to approach it on its mystical terms and then work with it from there. So, you know, let's say if you were in one of our classes, I'd say, well, keep pursuing your spiritual development. You clearly have a lot of potential and there's a lot more for you to uncover about yourself. So you explain the science behind it. <laughs> OK, so what, what does science really say? Science is a methodology, right? The scientific method. You you have a, a you know have a, you have a principle here. You're saying okay x y and z. You put it to the test. If it produces the result and if it's duplicatable, then it, we call it it's proven. Right? That's a proven theory. In a sense, nothing's ultimately proven because always there's things that can come up and say oh here's something new we didn't know before. But we know if we do follow a certain protocol call it almost now an algorithm, it'll produce a certain result. Metaphysics is the same way. If you follow a certain prescribed training, it will lead to a certain result. The difference is the training usually takes quite a bit of the time. In other words, you may spend years or decades building these inner talents and powers. And then, but if you follow the rule of thumb, it will take you from A to B to C to D. And I've been on this road a long time, and I was very like you. I was very excited when you know all, the, very excited when I started, and I'm more excited now because it's like an art form. You it builds over time, and you learn more, you apply more, you experience more, and each step kind of takes you to the next road. But you can't compare it to the. There's a spiritual physics. Let's put it this way: just as there is a physical physics. But you have to apply apples to apples and oranges to oranges. You can't take physical thing like equipment and say, well, I'm going to use physical equipment to see the spiritual world. It, it doesn't work like that. Just like you don't use your eyes to hear. You know, you've got to use the equipment and sensories that are appropriate to where you where you are. Although I will say one little thing there. They have in the 1960s, there was the curly in photography. I don't know if you know about that where they did, it was the beginnings, not, not the aura cameras that you see now, those, those are just not really what they say they are. But for example, this was done in Russia, they would take up, they would cut a fresh leaf, they put it on a photographic plate, and they'd run a, a little current through it, and there would be these flares, like a little aura around the whole leaf. Well, not every single time, but if the conditions were right, they would try, they cut a fresh leaf, then they cut the leaf in half, put the half cut leaf on the photographic plate, run the current, and you would see this flare up around the entire leaf, including the part that was cut off. 
how did that happen? You know, metaphysics would say, you cut the physical, you cut the leaf in half, but the etheric leaf is still there. And the electrical current was able to detect that etheric leaf. Briefly, you know, it doesn't last long, but enough to know how did that happen? You know, <laughs> so there are inklings if the mind is clear and the mind is willing to explore the uncharted territory to understand that there is beyond what we think is common sense and that this is part of our life. Again, I come back to you, ask me, what do we do? But we, our basic foundation is we are not the physical body. We are a soul inhabiting a physical body. And, and let's say when you're talking about your grandmother, you know, she was in her astral body. She was in her spiritual body. And this is how you can, you know, ghosts are, are really, they're not really ghosts. They're just people that are in their astral form, but they're still on the, the earth plane. You know, and so you see them, and the reason they can appear ghost-like is just the perception. But the astral body is as real as the physical, in a way. Actually, the, on the other side, they say this is the dream world, and the other side is the real world. <laughs> yeah. So that that leaf situation, that leaf example, um, makes me think about if I step on a train track and I've got rubber shoes on, they say I'll still get electrocuted because the electricity will jump from the track to my leg and i'm like but my my rubber shoes are there and it's like well no the energy will it knows where to go so when you say about mm -hmm. the leaf even though we've cut the physical leaf in half the energy around the leaf it's still there the same as if there's a storm and there's a tree they all say don't stand by a tree because the current will find you as well and to me right. that's exactly what that says whether it's right or not um and the second point was um yeah so a lot of people they you're right they 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 either believe in god and all the bible rules or the energy and law of attraction rules and it's the same thing but a different thing and you can't merge them it's like two languages saying the same thing and you know the the, the science behind it like there's someone called darren brown and david blaine in the uk and they do all these metaphysical stuff. Like he could be in one room and he's making everyone draw the folk, draw a painting that someone else is drawing in the other room, right? Even across the world, even somewhere else. So, you know, he's able to tune into that, like the person, the patient in the room, able to tune into the operation next door. And it's like, how do they do that? And then you think about jellyfish. Jellyfish are pretty much electricity energy, but they're physical, right? So, you know, the physical and the spiritual, they come hand in hand, the same as yeah. I can make myself believe my grandma's here, but she also could be here. And there's no way to prove that she was or wasn't because it's just this joint world where when you believe something is there, it's there. When you don't, it's not. It could be there, but by observing it, you collapse it and it's not only when you're observing it. And then when you look away, it is. It's so, it's so complex. Um, and also you what you said it relates to a uh, quantum entanglement you know it kind of knows over here when you've changed something over here you cut the leaf and it's like well i know the leaf other half is still here I don't you know i'm not stupid it will just find its way around it and it's it's mind-blowing there's two worlds in in this world that we see is just as one yeah do you know yuri geller have you heard of yuri geller absolutely the yeah Right, right. Um, I, we actually went to one of his demonstrations and, you know, try to say it was a magic trick, but I know it was not a magic trick because the, he didn't, this, the, it wasn't a spoon that I saw him bend. It was a, 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 a key and it was a person's key. They put it on the chair next to me, us. That key kept bending. He wasn't even touching it. It bent till it reached a 90 degree angle and then it stopped. And he told the great story, exactly what you said. He said, how, did, how he became famous. No one really knew him in Israel. And um, he was at a party with Golda Meir. And they said, uh, you know, it was kind of like you're saying, let's, you know, Yuri can kind of do these psychic things. And um, so they put him to the test, they asked Golda Meir to draw something in another room. And he would draw it. And not only did he draw, she drew a star of David, right? So not only did he draw a Star of David, he drew it exactly the way she drew it, right? So she's on national TV, 
TV, the, a radio the next morning. They're asking her a question. She, she goes, I don't know. Ask Yuri Geller. <laughs> she said this on air. And suddenly he was a, a national name in one moment. <laughs> you know, um, but like, for example, when you like, you know, when we go out, go out the house, <clears throat> we see physical. But what we don't realize is that everything is operated by the metaphysical first. Whether yeah. you choose to go right to that shop or left is because there's some energy along there. There's a friend you don't want to see down that path. So you go the other way or you need to extend the time it takes to get to the shop because your mum's going to call two minutes when you're in the shop, but if you'd gone the other way, you'd have left the shop. So it's buying you time to 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 be in the shop to receive the call from, say, I'm a mum saying you need to get me some carrots because if I'd gone that way, I'd have already left. So everything is operating on this metaphysical term, whether we know it or not. And it's when you truly understand it that when something happens, there's a metaphysical reason. It's it's incredible. It's like a whole new world. But we do have these spiritual senses as well as physical ones. And you bring up an important point that, let's say, okay, if somebody is literally clairvoyant and, you know, you can see the aura or whatever, that sense is very awakened, but it's still available of all of us. So why is it you walk into a room and it's kind of a plain room, but you feel wonderful in there? You know, you're picking up a really positive energy that's in there. You could walk into a palace and feel miserable because something terrible some terrible energy you don't necessarily see it clairvoyantly but you do pick it up energetically so you bring up a good point that many times we're influenced by non-physical things and we're not aware that that's what's really happening and the problem is you know you know we, we say intuition is the divine part of you speaking but because it's not rational we often tend to poo-poo it we don't we don't respond to it and when we get stubborn sometimes it's because we try to think in this very intellectual rational way only and what we what we teach in our classes the intellect is not the god you know the inspiration lead with your inspirational mind and then engage your intellectual mind to put the process together the the, the intellect is is the processor but it's not the person running the keyboard you know this it's not the person putting the the data in so to speak so we need to live a more inspirational life where we're letting this higher energy in and then exactly what you're saying then put it to the test you know socrates always wanted to challenge people right he he wanted to challenge people's how to think because if people were build, believing something very superstitious he would challenge them on that you know Oh, it's the God of rain that did this to, the, you know, things like that. So he helped you to clear, think clearly. And boy, today in this information age where, um, what do they say? A false idea travels the internet six times faster than the truth because it's usually sensationalistic. And and the instinctual mind, the, the fear, the worry, what, what, the world's coming to an end tomorrow? You know, we tend to look at that first and, hey, this is the best day on earth, you know, kind of a thing. So we have to be smarter about this than ever before because the spiritual is going to get stronger. People are going to get more and more into this. The energy of this is going to get stronger. So we do have to get smarter about it so that we approach this in a very level-headed way. And do you think that we're going to get back to what we were hundreds, thousands of years ago um, or more than yep. our ancestors because of what yeah, we now oh, know yeah, about the world? Yeah. Oh no, the the one of our one of our teachings is that the, the veil between the physical and spiritual is slowly starting to lift again. And it's going to lift in a more beautiful way than it did centuries ago. No, we're definitely heading that way. I know that it feels like the world is falling apart at times, and there's certainly a lot of dramas in the world, but it's actually, if you really look at it very broad stroke, the world is getting better, not worse. So we're going through a lot of growing pains right now but we're headed to better days and look even having a conversation like this not that long ago you'd, you'd have to be in an ashram or a mystery school to have this conversation you know so the fact that it's being broadcast and it's there means there's so many people genuinely interested and they're searching and it's the same with the pyramids you know pyramids in egypt pyramids in turkey oh. wherever they are around the world it's like well 
there wasn't probably boats back then. They can't walk millions of miles. So really, oh, no, you know, there wasn't the industry. There wasn't the industry of today. So that's unique to today. Yeah. 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 It's like, well, how did they, you can't just tell that person and then he'll walk over to that part of the earth and build a pyramid because it fully would have died by the time he got there. So they're all creating these pyramids in different parts of the earth. How and why? And you could say <clears throat> aliens so they can fly around quicker and, transport information and maybe so but if it's humans how are they doing it well they're tuning into similar thoughts across the world mm -hmm. like they look at the moon they're tuning into the same thing like is there more out there or what's that thing that flew past it's probably a bird or a flying dinosaur but you say it's a ufo and because that energy is going out there someone across the earth is picking up on those thoughts same thoughts same time doing the same thing like parallel worlds and you know this is happening on another planet and all that type of stuff. It's truly, it's truly amazing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the thing with the aliens, though, it is kind of kicking the can down the road because it's still saying another being just did this. But also, as far you brought up the pyramids, you know, one of the things many are realizing now is that we don't really understand our own humanity, the history of our own humanity. There seems to be a veil past a certain time. We think okay beyond recorded history well they could have been hunters you know there's no sense of what really went on before that now yes we have evidence there were certainly primitive people but there's also evidence of a much more sophisticated civilization um an interesting thing with the pyramids a geologist right now uh, was looking at the sphinx of the pyramid and just looking at it as a geologist not an archaeologist and looking at the, the erosion of the, the way the, you know, the Sphinx was eroding, said, this is water erosion. This isn't sand erosion. And it's a lot. It's not a little bit, you know. And the last time, of course, there was real water there was seven 8,000 years ago. So the, now the archaeologist said, that's impossible. We know it was built, you know, 3,000 years. You know, they, they put it in their time frame. But now that these different disciplines are starting to communicate, they're realizing something else is going on here. Could it be that these pyramids and these things are much older than we think? And that civilization is actually much older, that, you know, intelligent civilization is much older than, than we think. So it's going to take, I think, future generations to, to get around to kind of solving that puzzle. But I'm sure we will. I'm sure we will. And when you think about, you know, how old the Earth is... You know, when people say that the iceberg, the icebergs are melting and it's down to human beings, I'm like, yeah, I agree that if you're heating up a certain area, then the environment directly around it is going to be affected. And if you spread out what those humans are doing every, say, 10 meters, then pretty much it's all going to be hot. Right. And I'm like, we don't have enough recorded evidence back billions of years to see the icebergs melt, melt for a period of time and then don't melt, melt for a period of time and don't melt. We can't just like watch David Attenborough. But David Attenborough is a hundred years of being in the Antarctic, seeing it melt. Cause I'm like, the earth has been around for billions of years. You could like, we right, don't know right. if there's hot cycles, cold cycles, hot cycles, cold cycles. The same as we think that summer starts in say, june ends in september and then it's autumn from september to december and winter from december to january because right now the seasons are changing significantly it should be winter right now but the trees are still on the the uh, leaves are still on the tree we've not been around long enough to see that just because we've read it in the calendar autumn starts on this day that that's it forever that you know just because the icebergs are melting doesn't mean it's global warming we don't know the patterns of billions of years to say exactly. this is just exactly. a cycle well, people are confusing weather with climate. You know, you don't measure climate in years or decades. It's centuries and millennia. You, don't, you, you can't say, oh, we had a hot summer, climate change. No, it was a hot summer or it was a cold summer. I remember in the 70s where they thought we were going into an ice age, that they thought we were heading into the opposite. So we can't measure that in like exactly you're saying, even in our lifetimes. It's not... 
you know, we know the Sahara was fertile at one time, right? Talk, they're, they're, I think they found dinosaur bones there or, or, or fish. But this, it was a very different area, but we're talking way, way, way back. Nothing really recent. But of course, the weather is changing. We're actually, from what I understand, we're in an interglacial period. For the last million years, there have been these intermittent glacial warm periods, and we happen to be in a warm period right now. The last one... It could easily just shift the other way and go back into an interglacial. Civilization is going to change dramatically. You know, if that here in the United States, the Great Lakes are all remnants from the last ice age, right? So it it could go the other way again. There was one mo mo point where the whole world was like a big snowball. You know, <laughs> we were completely covered. <laughs> that must have been a fun time if anybody's around. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like, you know, the world could have been completely covered in water at some point and then it dries up and then it's half water, half dry. Then it's half ice, like the ice age. And then it's desert, right? Like say Mars. For we know, it's not like, okay, so humans are like, okay, the icebergs are uh, heating up. A hundred years ago, they were this degree. And therefore the billions of years before that, they were this degree. So what they're saying is billions of years, it's been this degree. The last hundred years, it's now this. Humans are heating the planet. Therefore the icebergs are related to the humans, right? Whereas it should be, there is probably cycles where there's certain parts of the earth that's hot, certain parts of the earth that's cold, some part of the earth that's more wet, some part that is not. And we simply haven't been around to really see the cycle. Um, and I do think that it's just humans trying to control things and own stuff that's not theirs to own and blame other people so they can be responsible in a more <laughs> productive way. And it's just humans thinking that they're God. And um, yeah. Yeah, it's not our planet. It's not our, we're, we're, we're inhabitants on the planet. Yeah, for sure, for sure. But, uh, you know, coming back to, again, kind of the spiritual, one of the things we hope to encourage people is, like yourself, when you've had your awakening, when you've had the understanding something more is going on, don't ignore that you know that's sort of the divine knocking on your door and you're you're so the, the idea is pursue it you know see where it leads you to um again in my case it was such a dramatic opening i, I had i felt compelled to to seek it out and it's not always an easy path right because people around you may not always understand what you're doing um but it will lead you to some extraordinary things I know we haven't talked about things like meditation and prayer, but one of the big things we do at the Institute is meditate and pray because that meditation is that quieting of the consciousness, the stilling of the mind, the not getting the outside stimulus so you can really hear the inner voice start to speak. And we definitely recommend that. Now, here again, looking for physical results, the Dalai, you probably know the study, the Dalai Lama, asked the science community to research his 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 monks like 30, 40 years ago. And they did. And these monks were like, they called them Olympic meditators because they had accumulated like 60,000 hours of meditation. And the, 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 the doctor, the scientist that did the research said, well, here's how I would describe this. Imagine you bite into this delicious apple. Uh, there, there are chemical reactions going to go on in your brain related to the pleasure of biting into that apple. Well, these monks, their, even physiologically, their brain was operating at that level. They were in a constant state of like having this delicious apple. Mm. And then when they went into meditation, it went even further off the charts. Mm. And they decide, they deduced that if, if you meditate sincerely, half hour a day for the next three months, there's a discernible physiological change in your brain. So you are affect. It's kind of like you're saying it now from the other, you are affecting even your biology by the way you're living, by the way you're acting. You know, it's not a, this body. I mean, we know we can change the physiology if we work out or exercise, but you can change the brain. You, know, you can, in a sense, rewire your brain to be more flexible, to be more open Try not to get too caught up in the routines, only thinking in this kind of, you know, this is my range of thought. I won't let anything beyond this in. It's all nonsense. You've got to keep the mind flexible. You've got to be willing to try new things. But at the same time, 
like you you've done which i think is be beautiful uh you know challenge yourself don't accept it always at face value i really felt this was my grandmother but you know i can't say it 100 percent. right um yeah. anything you want to end with anything you want to plug before we uh call it uh, a day? well yeah well we we have books up you know you can go to our our website spiritualarts.org learn about what we offer we have single day workshops full courses we have several books that we're going to be coming out with a 25th anniversary edition of change your aura change your life and barbara martin is the the co-founder along with myself okay well i appreciate your wisdom and coming on and, yeah um, thank you it's a pleasure <laughs> yeah and um uh, i'll let you know when it's out okay all right all right you take care all right take care thank you very much all right bye ciao